in the name of Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Text for our meditation this morning comes from the gospel lesson from John chapter 17, as previously read. In the Old Testament, when God set aside the priesthood to serve him and his people in the tabernacle and in their worship life, he gave specific instructions about the garments that the priests were to wear. He asked the skilled workers from the people to make different garments, and these are the garments they are to make. A breastpiece, an ephod, not a word we're real familiar with, but that, that apron thing that you can see behind the breastpiece uh, on the chest there, an ephod, a robe, a woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. And all put together, you can see here what all of that might have looked like. Now for that ephod, the apron, and the, the breast piece there, they were to make that out of expensive yarn, gold and blue and scarlet and purple yarn. And then they were to fasten to it that breast piece. The breast piece was a very special part of the whole outfit because that breast piece was supposed to have 12 stones on it. One stone for each of the tribes of Israel and the names of each of those tribes was to be put onto that stone and then fastened to the breast piece of the high priest. And this was so that whenever Aaron, the high priest, enters the holy place, he will bear the names of the sons of Israel over his heart on the breastpiece of decision as a continuing memorial before the Lord. Now, what a beautiful piece of symbolism that God attached to that breastpiece that the high priest was to bear the names of his people on his very heart whenever he was serving them and leading them and making decisions for them. He would bear his people on his heart. Now, all of these special symbols, like the priestly garments and the breast piece and, and all of it, even the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, they all had specific and special purposes in pointing ahead to what was coming. The Apostle Paul tells us that all of these are a shadow of the things that were to come, the reality, however, is found in Christ. Now today, as we consider our text from John chapter 17, we see one of those shadows, the high priestly breastpiece, turn into its reality in Christ. See, see, today our text from John chapter 17, so often called Jesus' high priestly prayer, is called that because we see Jesus bearing his people of all time on his heart and lifting them up to his Father in prayer. Now don't pass over that fact too quickly without letting it sink in, without realizing what it means. Jesus bearing his people on his heart, that means that Jesus prays for you. Now, so often in my life, uh, there's all kinds of things that distract me from praying to Jesus. There's all kinds of things that get in the way, or maybe I'm just lazy and I don't want to pray. Whatever the case about me or you, Jesus does not forget. He prays for you. He lifts you up to his Father in prayer. Even on the most tumultuous night of his life, on the very night that he was betrayed, Jesus stopped and took a moment to pray for believers of all ages. So today, even though we're almost halfway through this season of Easter, we take a leap back in the timeline to that Monday, Thursday evening, the night that Jesus was instructing his disciples, the night that he gave them the supper, the night that he commanded them to love one another, the night that he washed their feet, the very last thing that Jesus did on that evening before he led the disciples down through the Kidron Valley and up to the Mount of Olives was to stop 
and to pray for himself and for those disciples in the room that evening, and not just for them alone, but for all who would believe in him through their message. And do you know who that includes? It includes you and me, who believe in Jesus through their message. That evening, Jesus stopped to pray for you. It was his closing prayer that evening in the upper room. Now, often that concept of the closing prayer is something that often is one of the pastor's duties when a meeting ends or when the worship service ends. The the pastor always seems to be up for the closing prayer. I can remember back to one of the first church meetings that I attended when I was a pastor in training. Uh, We call that a vicar. We got to the end of that first church meeting and my overseeing pastor, my bishop, he gave a little smirk as he looked over at me and then spontaneously announced to the meeting that Vicar would be leading the closing prayer. So my palms began to sweat, my mind went blank, and I began that prayer, and I prayed myself so tightly into a corner that there was simply no escape except to say, Jesus' name we pray, amen. Not Jesus, not for this, his high priestly prayer. He had this one ready for eternity, ready for the moment that he was going to lift believers of all time up to his father in heaven. Philip Melanchthon, one of the Lutheran reformers, the guy who wrote the Augsburg Confession, which is like the foundational confession of our church body, He spoke about these words and said, no no worthier, no holier, no more blessed or exalted voice has ever been heard in heaven or on earth than this petition of the Son of God himself. So highly he regarded the words of Jesus' high priestly prayer. So when Jesus prays for you, well, what does he pray for? The very first thing we focus on today that Jesus prays for you is complete unity. Jesus says, I pray that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. See, Jesus wanted you to be as tightly knit and united to him as he is to his Father and to the Holy Spirit in the Holy Trinity. Now, it's hard for us to try even to comprehend what the depths of that unity would look like, but try to imagine just for a second what it was like before the creation of the world when there was no world and there was no people and there was no sin. There was only Father, Son, and Holy Spirit expressing perfect love and unity and harmony with each other in perfect peace. And that's the unity and harmony and love that Jesus wants to bring you into. He wants you to share in that with him and with each other. That's the perfect and complete unity that Jesus was praying for as he had you in mind. Now, many times people will say something like, I don't know, Jesus is, he's kind of irrelevant He had some good things to say about long ago, but most of that is outdated. And that's just about the farthest thing from the truth, because I would submit to you that one of, if not the most pressing issue that we have on the American table today, is the division and the disunity that comes from every and every issue that threatens or succeeds at dividing us. 
Even just this past week, we saw how explosive the division and the disunity and the resentment and the frustration of all of that can be as the issue of Roe versus Wade once again sprung to the top. And before that, it was the issue of how to handle COVID and how to handle vaccines and how to handle masks. And before it, it was an everlasting string of issues before that that seems to divide us that won't let anybody agree about just about anything. Does any of that really come as a surprise when you think about the people that it involves? People of widely different cultures and backgrounds and preferences, all vying for the same thing, all with sinful natures who are essentially looking out for number one It really doesn't come as a surprise that these things can cause so much frustration and resentment and division and disunity. And you and I are by no means immune. I can let any one of those things get under my skin and make me angry and make me hostile and make me resentful, make me start lashing out and putting people down and making me start to build a fence to divide myself from anybody in my family or at my church or in my community who seems to think differently than me. But when that happens, when we're all divided in anger and resentment, we don't win. The devil wins as he divides and conquers us. And we end up by ourselves, off somewhere, angry and alone, resentful and pouting. We don't win when that happens. And the only person who could do anything about our dreadful plight is the one who made it. His fervent plea, his life's work, his dying wish, his last will and testament to do something about it. We see Jesus praying fervently and the next day going to his death in order to fix our dreadful plight. It's the very next thing we see Jesus pray for. After complete unity, he prays for you to be with him in glory. See, our great high priest Jesus prayed, Father, I want those that you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory that you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Jesus does not want you sitting angry off somewhere by yourself. He wants you with him, enjoying the unity of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit with other people, enjoying the company of the saints along with him. That's what our great high priest had on his heart on the evening that he was betrayed. He had you and your well-being and your eternal safety on his heart as he lifted you up in prayer to be one with the Father and to be with him where he is in eternity. That's the whole reason that Jesus came to make his father's love known to the world so that they would know the father and the son and be one and be with him in glory. Jesus continued on, righteous father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Now, these words are not just the pious platitudes of somebody who's trying to garner uh, votes. These words are the last will and testament of our dying great high priest signed in his own blood. See not just what he said, but what he did in order to make us one. And in order to bring us to be with him in glory, the writer to the Hebrews tells us, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect 
through what he suffered. So Jesus not only prayed for you and for your well-being, but he also suffered and died and rose to do something about your well-being so that you would be with him in his glory, be with him where he is. Our great high priest on that evening held you in his heart so that he could hold you in his arms forever. So great was his love for us. Now, as we think about the things that Jesus prayed for on their evening, there's just one more thing that we want to consider and remember. That's that Jesus was praying for you to help make known the Father's love to the world. See, the thing about all of this, all of Jesus' efforts in praying for you, all of his efforts in suffering and dying and rising was for you, but not just for you alone. It was for all who would believe in the message. People from every tribe and race and language, people of all different backgrounds and cultures, rich or poor people of the world. St. John painted a beautiful picture. We might even almost call it a mosaic of what that will look like in heaven one day. We heard it in our second lesson today from Revelation chapter 22, the last chapter of the Bible. There we heard that there will be a great multitude, people from every tribe and language and nation. They'll all be different, but there will be one thing that unites them. They are all wearing robes that are washed white in the blood of the lamb. And they're all streaming through the gates of the city to the tree of life and to the water of life where they get to eat and drink and live forever. And the lamb is the center and the light for his people. And there they will be forever in the complete unity and harmony that Jesus prayed for the true communion or community of saints, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. This is the picture that Jesus wants us to show to a dying world, sinners of every stripe washed in the blood of the lamb. And when we are able, even just for a brief moment in this life, to come together and to live in that unity, that Jesus prayed for us, then our world begins to see just a slice, just a piece of heaven. They get to see the Father's love being reflected and shown in each one of us. They begin to see the Father's love that Jesus came to make known to the world. So Jesus prayed for you to be completely one with him to be with him in his glory and for you along with him to help make known the Father's love in this world. And when that happens, then, then Jesus said, the world will know that you, Father, have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. When this happens, even in this life, we begin to see in a small way, how unity marches victorious in diversity. We look at Jesus' prayer for us, for unity, for us to be with him in glory and to make the Father's love known. We see the depth of love that he poured out in that prayer, and we say amen to that prayer. Your will be done, Jesus. Your kingdom come to us and to others now on earth and forever in heaven. Amen. Please stand. Hey, thank you so much for spending some time with us and worshiping with us online today. We are so glad you fed your faith through the work of Mount Olive, and we'd love to know that you fed your faith. So head on over to mountoliveappleton.com and click the online friendship register or just click the link in the description here. It takes about one minute to fill out. Thanks so much for spending time with us. God's blessings on your day.